all for coming out. It's such a beautiful day. I feel sort of guilty to have you <laughs> here listening to me. So I'm going to be talking about um, Gamergate and uh, trying to, to sort of tell a coherent narrative about Gamergate is in itself challenging. Um, and I think that if you look at the case of Jimmy Wales of Wikipedia, um, inviting people to improve the Wikipedia article on Gamergate, um, that's an example of a kind of appeal to sort of disinterested rationality and Wikipedia's neutral point of view policy um, around an issue that gets very vexed and emotional for a variety of parties. Um, so it was interesting because after this um, invitation from Wales, um, there was an allegation made that a group of feminist Wikipedians, so editors of Wikipedia, had been actually uh, barred from uh, editing entries that had anything to do with gender um, by the uh, arbitration board at uh, Wikipedia. Now, that story um, got picked up uh, by different academics who um, published it in different kinds of academic scholarly gray literature. Um, and it even reached the Guardian. So it was also picked up by um, mainstream <coughs> news, news sources. Um, and the thing is that actually the Gamergate kerfuffle about editors wasn't as neatly an anti-feminist move as it had been presented uh, by Bernstein, by Mandeberg, and by The Guardian, that in fact the kind of question of who these editors were and what their stance was, it wasn't it wasn't just sort of gamergators versus feminists. It, it was it was actually much more complicated, at least according to uh, someone from Wikipedia, then who subsequently lost her job at Wikipedia um, because she was also um, not considered a disinterested editor herself because she was uh, doing Wikipedia ed editing for corporate clients. And so just even this one story of trying to tell a coherent narrative about Gamergate on Wikipedia became incredibly vexed as all of these parties told different stories about who was included, who was excluded, what was the polite language, what was the impolite language. Um, so um, I'm part of a group called FemTechNet, as Sonia said, and thank you, Sonia, for that nice introduction. And thank you, of course, to Professor Wren for having me here. Um, uh, so uh, we have a manifesto about addressing anti-feminist -viol violence online, um, and we've also received a grant from the MacArthur Foundation um, for their digital media and learning competition. Um, to develop different kinds of toolkits for com combating online misogyny. So particularly for those of you who are students, um, I would be interested, you know, maybe during the Q&A or uh, afterwards, um, or by email, it's easy enough to find me on the web, I'd be interested in hearing your ideas about what kinds of solutions could be out there in order to kind of improve what's sometimes seen as a rather toxic stew when it comes to questions of gender uh, in different kinds of online communities. Um, I also uh, teach um, diff what's called feminist digital humanities, which means it's a sort of mix of theory and practice, so teaching some programming as well with my colleague Jackie Wernermont, who's also uh, the PI on that um, Combating Anti-Feminist Violence Online grant, um, where we think about things like, how can we think about code, archive, discipline, program and play um, as creative possibilities. Um, you can learn more about FemTechNet uh, on this website, femtechnet.org. Um, this is one of the co-founders of FemTechNet, uh, Ann Balsamo, and this is one of the uh, co-facilitators of FemTechNet, Lisa Nakamura, and uh, it's a great group that does a lot of work on technology. Uh, some of the basic um, ideas that FemTechNet is probably best known for is first of all the idea that technology is material, although it's often presented as virtual. So, um, you know, you're able to kind of have magical communication on your cell phone, but it is a physical, it, it depends on physical substrate. It depends on certain kinds of material. And even wirelessness 
depends on the existence of servers. It, it depends on satellite dishes. It depends on cables. It depends on all of this kind of physical material infrastructure. So one of the things that GemTechNet tries to do is draw attention to that kind of materiality of technology. Um, we also argue that technology involves embodiment, although it's often presented as disembodied. So um, even though you might feel like you're somehow out of your body and kind of able to engage in technology in ways that are um, divorced from questions of, say, race or gender or the ways that the body is kind of marked by difference, um, there are ways that computation is still an embodied experience. Right? You're not, you don't magically leave your body when you sit in front of a computer. You, 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 you engage with the machine in different kinds of embodied ways. Um, and often, uh, questions about race and gender actually become magnified um, by the technological interactions. Another important principle in our group is that technology solicits affect, although it's often presented as highly rational. So if any of you have ever seen uh, the video German Computer Kid, I believe is the popular title, where you see this, this boy who's playing a game seeming to destroy his computer in rage. Um, like, technology makes people emotional, right? It doesn't necessarily make us highly rational, Spock-like beings. Instead, it makes us much, you know, we have all of these feelings about technology and each other and, you know, and, and, and how that affect is managed is often an important question. Um, FemTechNet is also interested in the question of how technology actually requires labor rather than saves labor. So we often kind of have this idea that, you know, when you introduce technology, you get to save all this labor, but actually you create other kinds of labor. Um, and sometimes that labor doesn't get recognized as work. Right? It's not something that you can get a salary for, but you're actually doing all kinds of work. So for example, um, when you're using Facebook, right, you're actually creating content for that company. Right? You're actually creating the materials that they can do data mining on and they can create targeted marketing around. Um, and you're helping their facial recognition algorithms. Right? So you're actually doing work for Facebook, but you wouldn't label it as work. Right, but it's but you're actually contributing your labor um, to technological infrastructures. Um, technology is situated um, in particular contexts, although it's often presented as universal. So your personal history matters, your personal situation matters. Um, you know the the particular case, your own literacy history around technology. Those things all matter, and of course technology promotes particular values, although it's often presented as a kind of neutral proposition. But there are ways that the design of technical systems does propagate particular kinds of ideologies. So those are some of the you know, theoretical ideas that are important for Gem Tech Tech. So um, often when people talk about Gamergate, they talk about these two women. Um, and so I'd like to sort of start with these two women. Um, so the first is Anita Sarkeesian. Um, who created a channel on YouTube called Feminist Frequency. How many of you have seen Feminist Frequency? A couple of you? So, um, you know, she uh, initially uh, had a Kickstarter campaign that received a lot of misogynistic uh, hate, but of course she also received a lot of attention for this Kickstarter campaign and actually ended up raising far more money than she planned initially. Um, what's interesting about Sarkeesian's videos. And you know, there have been videos by feminists about the game industry for, you know, thir over 30 years. I and mean, in terms of feminist critiques of video games, it's not a new field. What was considered new, however, was Sarkeesian's videos um, had a wealth of evidence. So she would just have clip after clip after clip after clip after clip to demonstrate her points. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that she's a fan. She's someone who loves video games. And her argument is that the problem with video games being sexist isn't just that they're sexist, but also she argues that they are, um, they're worse games because of it. Because it means that people are just using cliches. So they're just making the same kind of game over and over again rather than creating new kinds of games. So she's arguing that the, that the problem with sexism isn't just that it's sexism, it isn't just that it's 
it's propagating injustice, um, but also that um, when you deploy sexism in games, you're, all, you're not being creative. You're not really trying to push the medium. You're not trying to do anything new. And so that was kind of, um, sorry. Um, that was part of why uh, she received a lot of critical attention for her work. Oh no, come on. Oh please, did it really just go black? Yes. <laughs> I know, see this is the thing, the materiality of the machine is coming back. Okay, there we go, all right. Your Wi-Fi and you'll probably stop. Okay, yeah, I will. Let's see. Oh, let's let's have everything come to life on my machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's just turn off the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay. And hopefully that will cause it to not that will cause it to just plunge into blackness. <laughs> because that would be the logical thing for it to do. How about now? Still black. I don't know how many of you have seen that um, British show, The IT Crowd, yeah. where it's, it's just guys all day long saying, turn it on and turn it off again. <laughs> um, and the other woman who's often pointed to in this story is an independent um, game designer, although um, calling her game designer might be a bit of a stretch because she, she's really kind of an interactive media designer um, who made uh, a piece of interactive fiction, very realistic fiction, called Depression Quest, um, which people will often describe as an independent game. Have any of you seen Depression Quest? Uh, I actually don't think it's a terribly good game. I think it's really obvious what you're supposed to do, right? It really telegraphs, you know, it's like you have um, four bad choices and a good choice, right? And you're pretty clearly signaled what the good choice is. Um, and so you're, you know, encouraged to take medication and go get therapy, right? Which it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. Um, However, what I'd say is remarkable about the experiences of these women, so they received very intense campaigns of harassment. Um, they were doxxed. Um, doxing means that all of the, your personal details, like your home address, your social security number, and all kinds of your personal cell phone, uh, all that information was pu publicized on the internet so that all of their personal privacy was violated. So they had uh, 24 7 harassment, including, um, you know, people describing what their, you know, houses look like, you know, and how they were going to come in and rape and murder them. So, um, both women, uh, Sarkeesian gave a well known TED talk to talk about her experiences of harassment. Um, Zoe Quinn uh, wrote a number of sort of influential online pieces about misogyny. So, in some ways, analyzing their experience, um, you know, it's more interesting not to have my secondhand analysis, but instead I would encourage you to kind of go to the internet and, and encounter the firsthand uh, testimony that these women offer. Um, however, I might point out that it's interesting that it's these two women who become the focus of so much media attention. Because in a lot of ways, they represent a kind of normative white feminism um, that um, they kind of perform a certain kind of gender and sexual identity that is read as being a kind of conventional uh, form of kind of traditional, uh, uh, they're operating already from a series of, of, of positions of privilege. Um, so that the, their identity as women and as feminists uh, is still coming from a kind of a privileged position. Um, while there are also a lot of women uh, who were uh, uh, harassed, who were uh, either women of color or trans women, or in the case of Maddie Bryce, both, um, who were also uh, victims of harassment. 
And Bryce is actually a pretty well-known designer and critic of independent games. Um, and her harassment sort of received less media attention. So kind of one question is kind of who gets depicted as victims? Who's sort of seen as the kind of telegenic personality to represent the victims of online misogyny? And like who is considered kind of non-normative and not the, not the, not the people that, uh, the, to, who invite identification? Um, and, and by following the social media streams of these women, you can have a sense of the sort of the daily experience of harassment, right? And here's the part of the night where I call the police, right? This sort of routine of harassment that goes on uh, around the, the very intense um, campaign of terror uh, around Gamergate. Now, of course, online misogyny as, isn't actually that new either, right? Feminist criticizing video games, not new. Uh, people talking about online misogyny, not new either. So in fact, you can look, there's a piece from 1998 by Julian DeBell called A Rape in Cyberspace. And he's actually talking about a text, um, I think he's talking about a move. he's talking about Lambda Moo. So he's talking about a text-based virtual environment. So before there were 3D graphical worlds, right, you could have a feeling of online community in these text-based environments where you're just typing text. And DeBell describes being a, an observer, a bystander, to an online rape that's happening in land of Lambdamu just involving text and two seemingly disembodied people. So this question about online misogyny, um, it, it's, people have been talking about that at least in academic circles for decades. Um, it's also interesting to sort of think about the confluence of feminism and gaming and feminism and game studies at this kind of particular historical moment. And again, there's a longer history of that. Um, so one important um, forebear in this history is the game designer uh, Brenda Laurel, um, who for many decades has been designing not just games for girls, but games that um, are designed to, to be critical of, of the ways that particular kinds of gender norms get reestablished in gaming. Um, however, I would point out that it's important to realize that feminists study masculinity too, right? You know, so that you can, you know, you can think about um, performing masculine identity in game environments as being something that feminists might study as well. So it's not just a question of studying women in gaming. Um, often, uh, feminists who are studying science and technology are interested in the question of what how men in gaming might be uh, operational. So for example, Betsy DeSalvo and Amy Breckman look at um, sports masculinity um, in different kinds of gaming environments. T.L. Taylor and Emma Witkowski write about land parties, um, and they have some sort of interesting research that they do. And the reason that, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why are you interested in games? Right? Why is this compelling? Um, sometimes when I give a paper at an academic conference, I'll have like people come up to me afterwards saying, oh, my grandson plays video games, or my nephew plays video games. And it's like, great, so you're comparing me to a child. Well, this is awesome. But the, the reason that I think games are interesting is games are rule sets. They're ways that we can think uh, systemically about what's fair. Right? So if you play a game, you have a rule set where different parties can, can follow these rules together. They agree to the rules. There might be effects of the rules that they can't see, but there's a kind of interest in the question of fairness that, that gets a lot of attention in games. Um, any of you who have ever dealt with someone who is a pathological cheater at games um, probably is interested in this question of fairness, whether it's an older sibling or whoever it was. So, and, and this question about rules is also interesting because I think there's sometimes, um, a lot of people are interested in this question of happiness. Right? How, do, how do games make people happy? In what way does, does like participating in this kind of rule-based system, in some ways, 
playing a game can be more fair than the real world, right? Because when you play a game with someone, you know, you don't necessarily come in with all of the benefits of, say, wealth and privilege and uh, education um, and, you know, where you happen to live in the world, um, if you're in the global north or where you are. Um, so games kind of give you this opportunity for self-realization and joy that you might not get in your regular life. Your regular life might kind of suck in comparison to a game. Um, but that's actually not what I'm most interested in. I'm actually interested in the pursuit of justice. I'm actually interested sometimes in games that model the unfairness of the world. Because it lets us actually talk about the unfairness of the world. Well, um, other times we might not really talk about how that world actually becomes unfair as a system of rules. And that's one of the things that's exciting to, game, to me about games. OK. So now I'm going to kind of get to my basic argument about Gamergate, which is I think the thing that's interesting about Gamergate, when you're looking at the Gamergaters and you're looking at the feminists, and it's not that binary or that simple, but both parties are interested in this idea of worlds that are separate the possibility that you might have a world that's separate from the world in which certain principles operate. And they're both interested in the idea of a shared public sphere. So let me sort of back up and start with the idea of safe space. So I don't know if you've seen the recent article that appeared in the New York Times. Um, it was uh, called In College and Hiding from Scary Ideas. Um, and it was about um, the trigger warnings discussion that's happening right now on many college campuses. And also about the idea that it's important to create safe spaces on university campuses so that people who've been um, victims of traumatic experiences don't have to be, uh, don't have to re-experience those traumatic experiences. Um, so for example, um, in this case, uh, um, there's a description of a safe space. The, the safe space, uh, Ms. Byron explained, was intended to give people who might find comments troubling or triggering a place to recuperate. And then this is the part that really gets me. The room was equipped with cookies, coloring books, bubbles, Play-Doh, calming music, pillows, blankets, and a video of frolicking puppies, <laughs> as well as students and staff members trained to deal with trauma. So the idea was that there was this discussion about sexual violence, the debate happening on campus, and that, that attending that debate would be too traumatic so that students who wanted to avoid the whole discussion could be in this kind of playroom that would be, um, and you know, what's disturbing to me about it is it kind of infantilizing too, right? It's, make, it's, turning, um, it's turning people who might have an issue um, with something into kind of potential children. Um, now, of course, safe space has a long history in feminist thought. Um, you know, because the idea was you would have these, uh, these, these spaces in which people could participate in consciousness raising or empowerment activities. And sometimes you wanted the spaces to be private because you were talking about very intimate things. And in fact, you know, in the 1970s, groups of women would sometimes get together um, with things like speculums to like just even talk about their bodies in, in ways that they really didn't want strangers be, being part of that discussion. Like they really felt like the, the discussion required that safety, that privacy, that separateness in order for people to be able to talk about these very intimate, personal, private things that they wouldn't be able to talk about otherwise. Now, of course, feminists talk also about this idea of brave spaces. So how do you create spaces in which people can actually challenge authority, where it might be possible to you know, not just protect yourself from things that might be disturbing, but also rehearse certain kinds of challenges to power, um, and figuring out kind of what the balance is between safety and bravery that's appropriate for doing particular kinds of identity work. Okay. 
So then, here's, here's where I'm going to bring in Gamergate. So a lot of Gamergaters argue that what the Sarkeesian and Quinn are presenting is damsel logic. So that they are depicting themselves as damsels in distress. Like they're saying, I'm a victim of online harassment. Come save me. Um, and so they're arguing that this sort of um, adopting this position of victimhood about online misogyny uh, is actually um, playing into the sexist norms that they're claiming they want to challenge. So that's one gamer gator argument. Right? So the argument is, no, you can't have this safe space because you're hiding that safe space. You're using that safe space as an excuse. You're not really participating in this rough and tumble discussion that we want you to have. Now, the interesting thing to me is that on the other side, there's also a claim about safe space. And the space, the argument is the rules of the regular world about sexism, about racism, those, were, those rules don't apply in the world of video games. Right? Because we understand that video games are not the real world. They're a kind of refuge from the real world. And, and they're inside this special magic circle where we understand that, that activities there shouldn't have consequences. And so by arguing that video games are sexist or racist, you are actually... Um, you're actually kind of violating the rules of those games in, uh, as they exist inside this special magic circle. So this idea of the magic circle comes from a Dutch uh, cultural historian uh, named Johannes Kuisinger. And he argues that all play moves and has its being within a playground marked off beforehand, either material or ideally, deliberately or as a matter of course. Just as there's no formal dif difference between play and ritual, so the consecrated spot cannot be formally distinguished from the playground. The arena, the card table, the magic circle, the temple, the stage, the screen, the tennis court, the court of justice, etc., are all in form and function playgrounds, i.e. forbidden spots, isolated, hedged round, hallowed, within which special rules obtain. All are temporary rule worlds within the ordinary world dedicated to the performance of an act of art. So it's a separate world. It can't be judged the same way that we judge the regular world. And this is an idea that's picked up by the game critic Edward Castronova, who says, um, these, the magic circle functions as a shield of sorts, he says, protecting the fantasy world from the outside world. So what's outside the magic circle? Right, markets, politics, law. Even though, of course, with, for a lot of people who are, uh, participate in persistent virtual worlds, actually those things do apply. But there are legal cases involving video games. Um, there are people who make monetary claims uh, around video games. Right? There are political activities that take place inside video games. So that magic circle doesn't all, the, the border of that magic circle is actually much more permeable um, in some ways than we might grant. Because actually the rules of the real world do often apply inside of um, the world of video games. Um, I'm interested in cases in which people understand their gameplay as being separate from the the, these kinds of rules, and yet they, they suffer particular kinds of consequences. So, for example, um, Sonic Jihad, who I interviewed in his um, apartment in the Netherlands, uh, was a, a Dutch gamer who was originally from Mor Morocco, uh, who created a fan film based on his Battlefield 2 play that got mistaken for a terrorist training video. Uh, and so, um, he ended up getting investigated. Uh, the video was actually shown in Congress as an example of how terrorists were supposedly using video games to recruit people to jihad. So, and he thought it was just a funny video. And he thought he was just playing video games. And yet, political actors were sort of taking this, this activity 
you know, that was seen as anti-American very seriously. Um, and then you have kind of other interesting cases where the question of which rules apply are tricky. So there, there was a, uh, you can either play against the environment or you can play against other players. Um, and there was a guild of World of Warcraft players where one of the members died. Um, and uh, this was someone who had played a mage in the game and had had, you know, developed these strong friendships, emotional connections to people um, also playing the game in that guild. So guild members decided to throw a funeral for this <coughs> member inside one of these player versus player worlds. Now guess what happened when all these people got together um, from this guild to hold a serious funeral? <laughs> exactly. Um, well, it, even, even worse than that, because of course, you know, what do people do in a player versus player environment? They attack each other, right? So all of these people are sitting ducks there for this funeral. So other, another guild found out about this and decided to attack them when they were vulnerable. So they came in and like attacked all of these people. Now, what was funny is uh, you have two different versions of the story, right? Who's breaking the rules in that situation? Are the people who come in and attack breaking the rules? They're saying, no, it's a player versus player environment. The people who are breaking the rules are the people having the funeral. Right? So figuring out like, whose rules apply is actually a really tricky thing to do. Um, and so one thing that I'm interested in is how um, gamer gators will sometimes characterize people like Zoe Quinn or Anita Sarkeesian as social justice warriors, as this idea that they're fighting for social justice everywhere they can fight for social justice, including places that um, they get ridiculed for fighting for social justice, right? It's ridiculous to fight for social justice inside a, uh, a role-playing game, according to um, certain uh, parties. So in that case, right, the feminists are seen as the invaders. Right, the feminists are seen as the ones who are coming in to a perfectly good game world and screwing it up. That's one version of things. Then there's another version of things that focuses on this idea that you know, the feminists are in their secret special bubble where they, they're functioning according to these separate rules and they don't want to engage in real debate. They don't want to deal with real evidence. They instead want to be shielded from questions about feminism, or defenses of men's rights, or defenses of military games, or defenses of violent games. Now, what's interesting is to see the hashtag not your shield come up, where uh, this was a hashtag that was associated with um, uh, women gamers, gamers who were people of color, um, trans gamers. Um, now, What's tricky is it seems like some of these accounts were sock puppet accounts. So they might not have really represented people who had those identity positions. Right? But the argument of Not Your Shield is um, demanding that all social ju justice warriors stop using um, uh, people as a shield to deflect genuine criticism. So, so you know, you're trying to use your own vulnerability as a woman, as a feminist, as a shield against criticism. So you can't engage in debate because you're asserting your own victimhood. So what's interesting is that in certain versions of characterizing their opponent's position, the opponent is an attacker and an, an unjust attacker. And in certain versions, the opponent is an unjust defender. Right, someone who is maintaining a barrier that's inappropriate because we're all in this big public sphere together. The internet is a messy place. People should be thick-skinned and be willing to engage in these debates. So for example, as a, as a Not Your Shield uh, tweet, I'm a mixed Filipino woman and I'm Not Your Shield j gaming journos. <laughs> gaming journos means game journalists. Gaming journalists. I'm capable of making my own decision on what upsets or offends me, game or game. Right? So this is someone who is asserting 
an identity that isn't a white male uh, traditional gamer identity, but also asserting um, uh, solidarity with Gamergate. And so you start seeing uh, uh, campaigns like this one, right? I condemn personal threats, I support women in gaming, but I'm against biased and corrupt game journalism. Wait, what? <laughs> Why is Gamergate about game journalism? Well, that's important. Um, because that's the central assertion of gamer gators, is they feel that Zoe Quinn um, received attention for a depression quest because of her personal relationship with a game journalist. Um, and then there, there were these kind of like wanted posters that were created, which were these lists of social justice warrior game journalists that were associated with particular kinds of game journalism. Um, and you see particular <coughs> publications, online publications like Gama Sutra and Kotaku um, being identified as problematic. Now, this concern about the ethics of journalism, like this idea that feminists are somehow influencing game journalists more than they should, um, strikes me as a little bit humorous because I've actually been a game journalist. I've actually worn a press pass at game conventions. And I will tell you, you know, the big game companies, they throw the most awesome parties. Right? They have <laughs> great swag, right? It is re those are really good parties. Game journalists are not influenced as much by independent game developers or independent gaming. Game journalists are, you know, it's, it's big AAA titles that are really influential. I mean, and plus, what's the advertising in a typical game journalism venue, right? It comes from big players, right? Independent game producers don't have enough money for those ads. So if there's a problem with the ethics in game journalism, I'm not sure that it's coming from tiny independent games. Um, although this is the gamer gate assertion, right, is that there's not enough transparency. And that concern with transparency um, now has gone beyond just a concern with transparency about game journalism in places like Kotaku or Gama Sutra. Um, it also s stretches to a belief that DIGRA, which is the Digital Games Research Association, which is actually a scholarly association that studies games, Right, that it's somehow tied to all of these other things and is secretly manipulating for a pro-feminist viewpoint. Um, and, you know, one of the people who studies Gamergate um, is Digra president, uh, Mia Consalvo, who actually wrote a great book on cheating that I would highly recommend. Um, but she gets all sorts of, of, of vitriol about uh, you know, the, the fact that supposedly she's not a real scholar and peer review isn't really legitimate. So the concern about the legitimacy of journalism has spread now to a concern about the legitimacy of academia. You know, and, and it, it gets targeted toward particular professors, you know, like Adrienne Shaw, um, who's described as a product of a propagandistic think tank. Um, we get to see things like um, so Shaw describes being harassed by Gamergate in a scholarly article. Um, you get people talking about, you know, her uh, her scholarly work is being remarkably superficial and poor, but also misleading and factually incorrect. So there's all this kind of concern about accuracy and, you know, are the standards of academic journals really high enough? Um, and part of how she got this attention is she wrote a piece called "Do You Identify as a Gamer." gender, race, sexuality, and gamer identity. And so I would argue that a lot of this Gamergate stuff really is about d definitions, right? Who's, who's a gamer and what's a game? So for example, this pro-gamer-gamer woman, who's actually a game developer, and she develops casual games, but she, she says she doesn't identify herself as a gamer, right? She, she wants to kind of maintain that identity to the kind of masculine, hardcore, triple-A uh, gamer. Um, and so what she does in casual games, like that's not a game. That's not a real game. Um, 
So it's interesting to sort of see women participating in Gamergate in ways that might remind you of you know, things like I don't, the I Don't Need Feminism campaign. Right? So how women are also participants is kind of interesting. At the same time, you sort of see these things like open letters to the gaming community coming out, um, game developers <laughs> groups uh, doing reports on diversity. So there's a lot of interest in the question of how diverse uh, gaming is. Um, and then you see sort of these big uh, festivals for independent games like Indiecade. How many of you have gone to Indiecade? It is in your neck of the woods. It's held in Culver City every October. It's like Sundance for video games, and it's like in your neighborhood. Um, anyway, uh, so this is one of the uh, uh, top winners in uh, Indiecade uh, last year. It was created by Nana de la Pena. Oh, I did that again, didn't I? I think it's on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. And what she has done is she's created, um, by the way, her, her team, uh, some of the developers on her uh, head mounted display team went on to found Oculus Rift. So. Um, she's doing um, very uh, immersive virtual reality installations. And this is an installation in which you are a bystander uh, watching someone beaten by the border authorities. So some people might say, is this a game, right? It's, a, it's an immersive simulation, but you can't actually intervene much in this beating, although you can take a cell phone video. Um, and so when you see people walking around holding up this, this thing that looks like a Christmas tree. That what that is, it, is that's actually sensing the, the, the cell phone that you're holding in your hand. So you're actually kind of pointing it. So you know, one of the arguments from um, those who are involved in indicated independent gaming is that there's a need to rethink these definitions of what is a game. So there's a great article by a feminist game collective called Ludica that are both, th these are people who are both critics and developers of games, called the hegemony of play, which argues that the sort of definition of what a game has been is, has been um, determined largely by a kind of white male continu uh, constituency. And they point out that the fact that actually in gameplay, uh, reciprocal and cooperative activities are also important as well as competitive and aggressive activities. So they often write about how, you know, role-playing activities represent a kind of continuum with dressing up, even though, you know, many people who might say have a good inventory of armor might not necessarily think of it as a kind of dressing up feminized activity. Um, and you see uh, people in Ludica like Celia Pierce developing cooperative games like Mermaids, um, you also see an interesting kind of rhetoric around failure. So you see independent games like Darfur is Dying. You see uh, games like Papers, Please. Um, you see this possibility of, of instead of succeeding in games, that you play a rule-based system where you're doomed to failure, like uh, this airport security game, where um, the rules about what can be allowed through airport security get more and more ridiculous, and so it hasn't. <laughs> As a TSA agent, you can't possibly keep up. Um, you have games, you know, of uh, assassination that have to do with politeness. Um, alter alternate reality games where you're imagining a world without oil. Um, you have games that are about things like spirituality, like Tracy Fullerton and Bill Viola's The Night Journey, um, where you're actually, instead of playing the game quickly, you try to play it slow, you try to reflect. Um, and you explore <laughs> spiritual landscapes, so mountain, desert, forest, ocean. We have different kinds of interfaces, like Mary Flatigan's giant joystick. Now the joystick is about 12 feet tall. Um, the funny thing about giant joystick, and it plays like sort of classic um, Atari games, is that you can't play it by yourself, or right? you can't move the joystick by yourself. So when I, I went to visit giant joystick, uh, I took a class with me, and we all sort of stood there and tried to kind of play, I think we were playing Pong or something. <laughs> you have games in which you try not to accumulate enough goods, like uh, Tracy Fullerton's uh, Walden, 
Like, you know, if you just try to kind of create a huge inventory, you're wasting all your time c accumulating. Like, what does that do for your lifestyle? So it's a game about actually balance. Um, and so I'd like to take a moment and kind of take a look at an independent game together. So I need a volunteer. Okay, great. Come on up. Yellow sweater. And I'm going to have... Okay. So we're going to go ahead and play. Hush. This will hopefully work. Finder. So this is one of the games that was highlighted at Indiecade, I think, um, a couple years ago. I think it was the 2010 Indiecade. Okay, so go ahead and get on the computer. Do people see it all? It's probably too bright. <laughs> So it says, Lillian, your child is crying. Calm him with your song. Into the letters as they appear on the screen. So she's going to see letters. Be calm. Wait for the letter to shine bright, but do not wait too long. The group that we will exterminate them is that they are only a single ethnic group. Just look at one person. Their physique and their physical appearance. Look at their cubits or nose and then break it. Finish them off. Exterminate them. Sweep them out of the country because there is no refuge. No refuge then. Oh, you lost. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> it's, it's 
but it is possible to actually win the game, but it's very, very stressful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. very, it's, it's, it's a game in which the assumption is it's going to be difficult to stay calm, yes. Can we get through the pause? Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's time I give a talk about games. I think it's really important to play a game mm -hmm. because I think that just watching uh, screenshots or just watching videos, like when you understand that there's a live player who's interacting with this rule system, you'll have a different kind of understanding of what it means to play a game. Um, now, obviously, this game is very different from a first traditional first-person shooter. Why? Go ahead. Sorry. Well, it's based on a historical moment. It's really based off of a lot of the modern things of making a political statement in a game. And it's also a very condensed storyline. You're only in one place. And mm -hmm. it's a rhythm game, which right. is also really different. Right. So you're, you're actually trying to kind of have this sort of slow like rhythm rather than necessarily kind of rush around and yeah go ahead well i've played games where you're the you're, you are the shooter or you are in control of a, of a, ve of a vehicle or you, know, you have a certain amount of control and your your com the competition you feel like you have eight you have the power is immediate and instantaneous and that was the kind of pressure that i don't think i've ever felt like in any kind of game because <laughs> a baby and yeah, you're in this very kind of, you're in this really disempowered position. Right? You don't have a weapon to defend yourself. I think the other interesting thing is like, I mean, if you play Mario Kart, I mean, and you crash, or there's, there's a lot of bloodless violence. And so even here, like, we know what Rwanda 1994, what that means. You know? And so it sort of makes it a little bit more, I guess, it's stressful because you can imagine yourself like a threat is really real, and it's not like, oh, I can die and then just come back again. It feels a lot more final. Although you notice that you're invited to try again. So I mean, in some ways it does have some of the traditional aspects of a game mechanic where you can die and come back, that there's sort of kind of a lack of consequences. But you don't feel that in the moment of playing the game. Um, you know, because of the way it's using sound design, because of the way it's kind of using this sort of minimal aesthetic. So I want to just show a couple more examples of uh, these kinds of independent games. Um, and then encourage some discussion. So you have um, the mod of Counter-Strike created by uh, Anne Ray Schleider, Velvet Strike. Um, let's see if I can get this to come back on again. Hmm. What? It's on. Okay. Um, you've got Joseph DeLapp's Dead in Iraq. So she, he actually plays with the real identity of soldiers who were killed in our, Iraq. And he plays in the America's Army uh, recruiting game. Um, and then will you know, kind of put his identity as the dead soldier there. Um, you've got things like the work by Wafa Bilal. Uh, uh, Virtual Jihadi is one of his pieces. Another one of his pieces uh, is Domestic Tension, otherwise called Shooting Iraqi Online. Uh, where you can actually control the paintball gun that shoots paintballs at uh, Bilal, who's an Iraqi American. Um, he actually lived for a week like this while people on the internet shot paintballs at him day and night, nonstop. Um, you've got games like uh, September 12th, which is a game um, where uh, if you don't shoot, you don't make more terrorists. But if you shoot, you start actually creating more terrorists. So it's a game that takes you a little while to figure out that you shouldn't be shooting. You should actually stop shooting. Um, you've got things like My Trip to Liberty City, which is a mod in which Jim Monroe plays a Canadian tourist who just wants to kind of tour the world of Grand Theft Auto rather than kill anyone. <laughs> like, likes, wants to explore the city and sort of see the different parts of it. You've got things like uh, Emily Roxworthy's drama, The Delta, which is set in a Japanese internment camp in the South. Um, Tale of Tales, which is an experimental um, game company, often known for um, creating feminist games uh, like The Path, which 
tells the story of Little Red Riding Hood from the perspective of a variety of siblings. It's a very interesting game because if you follow the directions and go straight to Grandma's house, of course you don't have any interesting adventures in the woods with the wolf who takes on various kinds of rapey, creepy predator identities. Um, and you can actually, the final scene, uh, you're going through a women's bathroom where you're seeing these uh, stalls. It's kind of an amazing, uh, horrific game that's about femininity and vulnerability and sexual coming of age. Um, you have funny mini games created by kids like Tampon Run as examples of sort of independent games. games you might have board games or, or games with uh, manipulables like uh, Brenda Romero's Train, which you start playing and you don't realize it's about the Holocaust until you're about halfway through. Um, she also created the game Me Mexican Kitchen Workers. So, you know, how these games uh, compare to, say, AAA titles like Call of Duty, where, you know, some gamer gators are actually creating fan videos where they're talking over Call of Duty play while complaining about various um, feminists involved in the Gamergate controversy. So it's interesting to kind of think about the role of certain kinds of militaristic gameplay. I actually enjoy playing military games, so you know I'm not necessarily the, the standard feminist who doesn't. Um, but I think it's interesting to think about how these kinds of performance of, of masculinity are also an important part of the Gamergate controversy. Um, how we can think about kind of these, these, you know, what does it mean to imagine, to imagine human interactions as being combat? And what happens to public discourse when you're imagining a kind of pro and con version of the world where you have two sides, where you're just trying to kind of um, uh, gain mastery um, and that's your primary uh, objective? Um, and so that's where I kind of like to leave my talk, and maybe um, I know we're we're at six o'clock, but I'd love to hear from all of you. So, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Well, I guess it might be a bit too soon, but have either side suggested solutions to the problems, like ways of becoming less militaristic, or else trying to get some some work on bridging the divides between the two communities? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I've actually been out of the country for a month, so my sense of where things are right now uh, is, is not particularly good. But I think that places like GDC, which is the game, big game developers convention, which happens in San Francisco, and I've, I've presented at GDC a couple of times, that's an interesting space where uh, independent games and AAA titles are sort of sharing um, the environment, and there is a lot of discussion because, you know, big AAA titles also want to create new kinds of games. And actually, the independent games market, you know, particularly after, um, you know, Steam became so important, like it's actually a kind of a money maker. And like creating, there's some indie gamers who've designed very successful AAA games. So, um, that dialogue between the sides is certainly something that the industry is interested in. And obviously, you know, you might not know this, but the typical, if you're talking about hours of play per week, your most hardcore gamers are actually, most hardcore online gamers, the profile is a woman in her 50s who plays online card games. <laughs> <laughs> they actually play, in terms of hours per week, they are the hardcore gamers. <laughs> they actually play more per week than like those Call of Duty people. Um, so the industry notices that. Yes, question. Um, so you mentioned earlier that, earlier that there's a lot of discussion about definitions in, in this, you know, what does a gamer even mean? And I wondered uh, if that could extend also to, there's also, a, I think, a question of what role does identity play in, uh, in collaborative video games, particularly those massively multiplayer online ones, in which some people, you know, they play the game, they say, you know, I'm a white male gamer, and some people say, you know, I'm an orc shaman. And, <laughs> you know, is there any kind of way to reconcile those two very different opinions that people think that it should be anonymous and people think it should be? Identity. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, 
it's interesting because some people uh, feel very strongly about performing authentic identities um, and that connection. You know, I think Facebook is sort of waning among the kind of target demographic, but for a long time, what made Facebook popular was the connection between your real world social identity and your real world friends and this platform. So that it was a way to kind of perform your real world identity in ways that were sort of visible to other people. Um, you know, the, the question of how you perform fantasy identities, I mean, those identities can still be very real, right? They have a certain authenticity. You know, the person who is the orc, like, that might be a really important identity as much as, like, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, you know? Um, I'm curious what you think about, because I know I hear this a lot, there are people who, there are women particularly who say, I'm not a gamer, and they associate right. the term gamer with, like, you know, a young white male who, you know, plays Call of Duty or World of Warcraft, but they play Kim Kardashian Hollywood on their clones. Right. And what do you, or like Candy Crush, and I'm really curious what you think about, I mean, what do you think about games like, that like mobile games that you can, they're really just, they're really easy, like tap to play. Yeah, so I'm gonna confess something. Users. This was my farm at one point. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever played Farmville, you know this represents hundreds of hours. <laughs> Which is very bad for someone who's like an actual published scholar. Like, <laughs> that much time playing the game. Now, I did get a couple of articles out of it, because I think one of the things that's interesting um, so Farmville is a social game, but you actually um, you actually have incentives for people in your social circle, to, including people in the game who, who don't actually play. So there are like these weird ways that you actually like people who invite other people to play online games are annoying to most other people, and you understand that you're actually violating a rule of politeness by asking someone to play the game. And so there's certain kinds of games where you're actually, like, you're, t you're inviting the person to play the game only essentially to create another asset for yourself in the game world. So you're doing a kind of opportunistic friendship move, and you could only do it with other people who are doing the same kinds of opportunistic friendship moves. Um, I think that when, when you're talking about games that aren't social, and there's a great um, documentary called uh, From Russia With Love that's about Tetris. Um, so games that actually don't have a kind of channel checking component, that they aren't, you know, you aren't comp competing against your friends, that it's kind of a, uh, you understand it to be a solitary activity. Um, it's interesting to look at how women often talk about those games. You feel a lot of guilt about it, right? Because it's taking away, they're, they're, it's wasted labor, right? It's, it's labor they're not spending on their domestic stuff, they're not taking care of their kids, they're not taking care of the house, they're not bringing money to the household, they're just wasting time on these kinds of tension relieving, monotonous, obsessive compulsive disorder games. And yet they're very delicious and addicting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is a straight continuation of this question and what you were just saying. But I wonder how the language of addiction comes into this. How yeah. much of that has to do with these debates about identity? Um, and I'm pretty skeptical about the, the kind of medicalization discourse. Of course, <laughs> and, um, and obviously it's been used against a woman who right. can be laboring more than against a man who's asserting his force. But um, because you mentioned card games, the language of addiction does get applied to gambling, to yes. online poker, an enormous chunk of it, as I know, what we can do in mind. Um, so how, does, how do those things kind of intersect yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge for me as a, as a game scholar because you know, I direct this program called Culture and Technology, which is based in a residential college. And so once a week, we have these meetings about students of concern, um, and we also do a lot of other, you know, kind of student well-being stuff. So meeting with the, you know, the head of counseling services and the head of the dean of advising. And a lot of what they're expressing in student affairs is concern about students and gaming. Um, and it, it's an activity that they want to control and limit. And of course, any time, and I just finished a book uh, that came out uh, last year called The War on Learning, Learning. I actually think any time that administrators try to control student digital behavior, 
it's always going to turn out bad. It's always a terrible, 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 terrible idea. And I'm always like, let me tell you 200 stories about how this will go south. If you try to, because you know, basically, you try to control people's digital behavior, and they will do a couple of different possible things. They will rebel against you and hate you. They will lie to you, right? They, you know, you just attempting to control digital behavior is just a, a non-starter. But you know, these counselors are, are very, I mean, uh, my feeling is that, that it's about other kinds of behaviors that are expressed through gaming, rather than necessarily the games themselves. Right, which hits a different limit with poker and money. Right, right. I mean, there's actually a great book called Grand Theft Childhood that was done by two Harvard researchers who were looking at the issue of antisocial behavior in boys and gaming. And what they found is that kids who play video games all the time did have more antisocial behavior. But also kids who never played video games also had more antisocial behavior. Because the kids who didn't play video games, what do we know about them? They don't have friends, <laughs> right? They don't have a peer group. They're not, they're not participating in normal peer behavior. So that actually the, the kids in the middle who were well-adjusted, like a lot of them were playing these games that were pretty antisocial, but not necessarily showing uh, antisocial symptoms. Yeah. Um, what about games where you, you have like a social group? Like say if you play like an MMO or something, you're in a guild, there are social norms, like almost like in the real world, basically the same. Yeah. Like, uh, that still apply. So, at that point, it it it's an analog for basically the, the, the real world. So it's, it's very yeah. Weird. And in fact, there's a guy. So Henry Jenkins makes this argument that we can learn a lot about human relationships by looking at game worlds. Right. And the people. Per they, they have an idea about participation that they learn in gaming yeah. that is, is something that they, they bring to other kinds of social relationships. So there's a guy named Nishant Shah who's studying students who are demonstrating in Taiwan right now and in connection with the Sunflower Revolution. And what's interesting is these young people are going into government buildings. And how many of you have played the game Minecraft? Okay. You see a hallway in Minecraft. What do you do? You go down, well, you, you know, you explore, right? So you go down the hallway to see what's there, right? You're in a room. What do you do inside the room? Do whatever. Do whatever. Do you ever barricade the room? If I, as the day goes on, you don't want zombies and creepers to pop up, so yeah. Okay. Is this like in Legend of Zelda where the joke about breaking everything in the room? Well, no. What was interesting is these these protesters who had been playing Minecraft all started imagining taking over government buildings as being like playing Minecraft. And they were sharing their experiences like, I'm in a government building. I see a hallway. What do I do? I go in the hallway. I see a room. What do I do? I go in the room. Some soldiers are like, you know, coming to get me. What do I do? I barricade the room, right? And they're like sharing knowledge as though it's like Minecraft. And like their, their social skills, their collaborative skills, their, their sort of spirit of exploration, their kind of willingness to try things out, like they're actually kind of bringing this to a scene of protest. So these kind of weird mixes of like the online world and the offline world, I mean, we're living in some interesting, messy times, which is, I think, part of the reason that, like, you know, administrators trying to contain it is a super bad idea, rather than just you're saying we're in messy times. Yeah. Um, do you think that the rise of games that make social critiques and the rise of scholarship that one day we will be analyzing video games in our classroom, just like we analyze books? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I mean, I think. You know, when I teach games, people in my class have to play the games. Mm -hmm. You know, just like I wouldn't teach a Jane Austen novel and not have people read the Jane Austen novel, right? They've got to actually, you know, if we're 
talking about America's Army, we all got to play America's Army, right? Well, kind of to go off of Sam's point, do you think there's a potential, I, I say this because it was kind of happened a little bit in one of my history classes, a game like Assassin's Creed that has very realistic renderings of a historical period or a certain time, do you think that could ever have potential as a, an educational tool? You know? Yes, although I think many, so, Sometimes they call educational games in the industry chocolate-covered broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially because they are neither good education nor good games. Um, what's interesting to me about Assassin's Creed is, you know, and I'm a pretty hardcore history buff, is actually some of the stuff is actually pretty good. Like somebody's just super crazy when they get to the Illuminati and all that stuff. <laughs> you know, we don't want to believe that. But you know, there are other details that are actually kind of correct about material culture and like, you know, specific things. Um, well, in the lead up, in fact, to the release of Assassin's Creed 2, which takes place in Quattro Centro, Florence, um, they had the developers talking and they had a scholar from Notre Dame came, yeah. you know, a, a medieval scholar from Notre Dame, Renaissance scholar from Notre Dame, and she said, this is the closest thing being in Renaissance Italy <laughs> that's out there. Like, if you want to know what it's like to walk around in Renaissance Florence, this is it. And I agree with you about the Illuminati stuff. I wish they would just have looked at that. What's wrong with just being an assassin? That seems like enough. But to that point, there, I forget the name of the game, but there's a, it's a mod that's being developed, but it is a, and it's, a, it, it's a Kickstarter, I'm almost positive, but it takes place in the Iranian Revolution. Oh, wow. I, I should forget what the name is, and I'll find out in a second. Um, but I think the potential there. I think the potential is great, but unfortunately, too often um, the games are developed by people who aren't good game designers, mm. and they're developed by you know academics, and we're terrible <laughs> game designers. We're awful at it. Yeah. So one of the things that came up fairly early on in your talk, you talked about the construction of a feminist programming language. So when I think programming, I'm thinking way back to. Turing's original paper, what a computation is. And then right. the programming paradigms we have around that are pack you know, if you read and Turing's language, it's it's nonsense to most of us. So we try to package that up in ways that are easy to understand. How does a feminist pro what are the what are the ideals of a feminist program? So that's Ariel Sch Schlesinger's uh, project, and I'm actually uh, there's there's a lot of interest in that idea. Um, when she posed it on the Haystack blog, she was widely um, mocked. And they actually created a, I thought it was kind of creative, actually, but a pretty mocking sample of a feminist programming language that was up on GitHub. And it was also got super reddited, so there was a lot of attention. And of course, she is, you know, she was a college student in a femtech net class, right? She's, you know, your age. And suddenly she has all of this trolly mocking attention, which is maybe not what the result that she wanted to have happen. But she actually kind of, um, I think she's in grad school in computer science now, so you can ask her. That's, so yeah, I, guess, I guess the root of my question is that computation, sort of formal computation theory, programming languages seems so far from social gender issues, all the rest of that. I'm just wondering what is particularly anti-feminist about object-oriented construction and functional programming? You know, where is the where are the yeah, social issues I mean, that I'm not seeing? I, I'm not necessarily uh, so I, I'm not necessarily in agreement with that argument, okay. but I do think teaching programming is a good way to talk about rule-based systems. And so when when we teach the feminist DH course, um, we use the um, the toolkit uh, associated with processing, and there, there are these books that, that go along with the um, with actually some pretty good videos. So there's um, there's the one about um, natural systems, modeling natural systems. So we use that to talk about um, games and simulations. Um, there's one that's about visualizing data, so we use that to talk about. And there are ways that you can do kind of a feminist take on, like, you know, I've been talking about games and sim simulations from a feminist standpoint. Um, you can also talk about, you know, how you curate particular archival objects from a feminist standpoint. I mean, there are a lot of different kinds of informational activities that you can talk about with code, right? How you, you know, um, now, a lot of these experiments, though, in doing either queer programming languages or feminist programming languages, the, the code doesn't actually execute. 
So it'll be, um, you know, it's kind of like a linguistic, it's sort of like a poem or a work of electronic literature rather than something that actually so I guess works. It's, and that's where I'm having trouble because it seems like you can definitely have feminist output from a code, or, uh, but the actual code itself. But I think that you can, you know, encourage people to ask questions about instrumentality, for example, which certainly has a certain kind of dimension of gender identity, right? How do you, you know, to what extent do you understand the relationship between, um, you know, organizing a series of steps in an algorithm? Um, how do you understand your agency in that? And like, how much is actually, um, how much ha actually has to do with other kinds of contingent factors um, is one thing that you can kind of do. Um, I, l I don't go all the way to the feminist. The game is, sorry, the game is 1979 Revolution. I did hear about this game, yes. <laughs> and it's not a mod, he's a former developer at Rockstar. Oh, okay. so. That might be good. And his quote is, one of the quotes he has is, uh, I don't want to preach. I'm making a game. I need to entertain. If I try to educate, I'm dead in the water. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my book, I actually write about terrible Shakespeare games. I'm sort of fascinated with bad Shakespeare games. <laughs> <laughs> and there are like a hundred of them. That's <laughs> great. Well, I, we are actually way over time, so I, I know that many of you are here for the uh, <coughs> for class credit. And as somebody who's an instructor myself, I hate to abuse students. But thank you. This is a great conversation. <laughs>